thank you, Father, that you are helping us to walk in that love so that we can see your dream fulfilled, that the world will see that you were truly sent by our love for one another. When they see our love for one another, when they see our love for them, they'll know that you were truly sent. Thank you today for these next few minutes that our ears are opened, our hearts and our minds are awakened and enlightened to your truth of your word, that we're not hearers only, but we're doers of it. In Christ's name we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. You may be seated. I'm a proud papa. We're going to release Life Kids to go to Life Kids today and be raised up as the kingdom citizens that they're called to be. Amen. Let me believe they're not the church of tomorrow, but they're the church of today. Amen. Amen. Boy, I just feel his anointing. Do you feel his anointing here today? Like flowing down my elbows. Hallelujah. Love it when he's here. We just were reading, uh, listening to 1 Corinthians 13. I believe it'd be fitting for us to go there and use that as our launching pad today for today's message. Turn to your neighbor and say, love is. You have to know what love is to walk in love. You have to know what it is. What it is. What is love? What is love? In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. In other words, the gong show. Got the gong show. Some of you say, well, I don't remember the gong show. That's back from many years ago. I dated, dated myself. I can tell when the 20-somethings aren't even moved by it. And the teens, they're like, what's the gong show? Anyhow, when you, when you messed up, they come and gong you. Now I think they do it at Apollo where the guy comes out there and, and sweeps them out or whatever it is. I don't know what else there is. But anyhow, that's what you've become. <laughs> Verse 2, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not what? I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. It doesn't parade itself. It is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Can someone say amen? Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails but where whether there are prophecies they will fail whether there are tongues they will cease whether there is knowledge it will vanish away for we know in part and we prophesy in part but when that which is perfect has come then that which is in part will be done away when I was a child I spoke as a child I understood as a child I thought as a child but when I became a man I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. How many are looking forward to that day, to see him face to face? Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Verse 13, key verse today. Watch this. And now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is you got the answer right in front of you, is, oh, so thankful you joined me, class. The greatest of these is what? Love. Love. Beautiful passage of scripture. Many people read it during their marriages. And I think when I get married again, I'm going to have that song they sang today, sang right there in that. I, I like that. That is awesome. Because love is, it never fails. God is what? And when you think about love, when you think about what he's doing 
in, in Scripture, when you think about 1 Corinthians 13, I can tell some of y'all are pondering and thinking about what I just said. It's all right. It will happen again. Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. It says, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given to us. Who was given to us. Let's look at that again clearly. Some of you lost me in the midst of all of the screams of joy in the background. Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. We know that she has lungs or he has lungs. Amen. Romans, maybe a preacher or a prophet in the making back there in the nursery right now. Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. Are you with me now? We'll read it in the God voice right now so you can hear it for real. <laughs> now hope. <laughs> Just teasing. All right. <laughs> now hope does not disappoint because, why? Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Many people look at what the Holy Spirit has poured out in their lives just related to the gifts of the Spirit or the manifestations or the signs and the wonders of the Spirit. But they don't realize that the primary reason the Holy Spirit has been poured into our hearts is love. 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 Let's look at it. Look at it. Now, hope does not disappoint. Why? How can I not have my hope disappointed? Why does it not? Why is it not disappointed? Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. When Holy Spirit moved into our lives, He moved in with love. Come on, somebody. He changed us from being angry people. Come on, anybody here used to be angry. He moved into that angry vessel and made that angry vessel a loving vessel. Come on. He came into that depressed person and he brought his love. His love being shed abroad in our hearts. Amen. Shed abroad in our hearts. It's that shining light of his love flowing in our lives is a work of the Holy Spirit. So I want you to recognize today for everyone that wants to be deep in the world, when I move into a subject called love, I want you to understand the deepest thing in the world is love. The deepest thing in the kingdom, I should say, is love. For God so loved the world. There's a great movement going on right now, and I appreciate some of the teaching that's taking place, even though there's some, some hyper teachings on it. As with any teaching, people have the, the, the uh, propensity of swinging way over to an extreme when they teach it. Right now, there's a message on grace that's come to the body. It's a, it's a great message, but there are many people that are taking it way out of context, and they're having greasy grace. It's way over there, greasy grace. And uh, anything, God's already saved me so I can do anything I want to do, and it's already covered. Now, that's not what grace is for. He said we're not to trample on grace. Come on, help me, somebody. So there are some churches in, in the city that have moved into that hyper-teaching and people that have moved into that, and you have to be careful. But grace is a great message right now, and there's a lot of teaching, a lot of songs are being written about grace. One of my favorite songs, uh, I'm believing we're going to hear it on Easter Sunday, covered by His grace. I'm thankful for His grace. Are you thankful for His grace? Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Thankful for His grace, but let's stop and break it down. There would be no grace if there was no love. Grace was born out of love. The greatest message of the gospel is love. It's not the gifts of the Spirit. It's not apostles and prophets. There would be no apostles and prophets if there weren't love. This all was birthed and originated out of His love. 
God loved the world so much that he gave his son. God loved us as his church so much that he gave the five-fold ministry gifts to thoroughly furnish us and equip us. He, get, he loves us so much he gave the nine gifts of the Spirit so that we could be encouraged and edified and built up and warned. And, and Come on, somebody. He gave us, but then beyond that, he gave us the nine fruit of the Spirit, which really, it's really one fruit if you really get into it and break it down. The eight are all descriptive of the fruit of love. It's love. So, you know, when you look at the fruit of the Spirit, it's patience. It's what? Come on, somebody give me something else. Kindness. What else? Goodness. Self. One at a time, please. One at a time. Raise your hand, class. What is it? What? Joy. Joy. Sweet joy. Peace. Somebody else. Long suffering. I don't like that one. Somebody say, I don't like that one. I've suffered long enough. Hallelujah. Amen. No. Meekness. Goodness, self-control. All right, all those things, if you look at it, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you look at love, it's really, when you get down, the greatest of these is love. The fruit of the Spirit, there's really only one fruit of the Spirit. It's just described in, in eight different love. Yeah, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And then out of love is what? Joy. And out of joy is what? And out of peace is what? So it comes, it springs, and originates out of what? Love. Why? Because God is love. So that is what Holy Spirit came into our life to do. Watch this. He said, I will come. Holy Spirit will come and remind you of my ways. Holy Spirit will come and remind you of the Father's ways, of God's ways. So he said, I'm going to give you a comforter, one that's going to come alongside a paraclete, one that will help you and bring you into all truth. Hallelujah. Stay with me just a second. I know you're ready to take notes and you're ready for five points and three of this and everything. Listen with the spirit ears just a second. Let the Holy Spirit touch you right now. Y'all are like, come on, what, is that? what am I going to write? What am I going to write? Come on, tell me, what am I going to write? What am I going to write? There is no acronym today, so don't worry about it. What is it, what is it I'm going to put down? Love is where everything originates out of. And how can I say that? Because God is love. So out of love, God's love for the world, everything that we have comes. And so if I prophesy out of uh, anything other than the motivation of love, if I move out of anything other than the motivation and the, the heartbeat of God of love, then my prophetic ministry, anything I do, will be uh, flesh, will be carnal. Come on, shake your coconut. You're with me today. Mm -hmm. This is good preaching. This is good teaching. So a lot of people say, I want something deeper. You can't get deeper than love. You can get deep in a lot of stuff, but I don't know what it is. But if you really want to get deep, you need to get deep in love. Go with me to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Boy, this is good stuff. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I love His Word. Do you love His Word? Yeah. I was going here next week, and Holy Spirit just called this up in my spirit today. So I'm going to go there because He said go there now. Watch this. Mm, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't you love His Word? Mm, it's good. It's mm -mm good. Colossians chapter 2. As you therefore, verse 6, have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Hallelujah. Rooted and grounded and built up in Him. Come on, somebody say, built up in Him. Rooted and grounded in Him. You need to be rooted and grounded in Him. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. I wasn't going to this today, but Holy Spirit is saying go there, so we're going. Amen. I study weeks in advance, so this is next week's message today. So we'll see what Holy Spirit says next week. It's going to be awesome. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love. 
Hallelujah. So the origin, the origin of our life, what we should be rooted and grounded in, what we should draw our sustenance from, our nutrients to produce fruit, to live this life of the Spirit that God's given us, should come from love. It should begin in love. It should flow in love. Amen. Amen. For God so what? Love. Love the world that He God so loved the world that he gave. Now, a lot of people, they live their lives in the flesh and they're not walking in the spirit. Somebody thinks walking in the spirit is walking, I'm in the spirit, I'm in the spirit. No, I can tell you when you're in the spirit, when you are in love. In the spirit doesn't mean that you're floating in and... You have a song, hallelujah, hallelujah, and there goes the Holy Ghost. That doesn't mean you're in the Spirit. What means you're in the Spirit is when there is no hallelujah, and nobody is there to pick it up or help you up, and you're upset. And somebody gave you the reason to get the spirit of slap. And you choose love. Come on, I'm not helping anybody out. <laughs> oh, Lord. There's a lot of people don't catch that. But see, if you're, not, if you're not careful, you'll find yourself walking in the flesh. Romans talks about this. It, it lets us understand this, this dichotomy, this, this warfare, this tug of war, if you will, between the flesh and the spirit, between the carnal mind, which the Bible says is enmity against God, and between this, this life of the spirit. This life of the spirit is a beautiful life when it's totally released and yielded to God, But when you try to pick it back up and live your life on your own, that's when you have a struggle. Mm -hmm. He said, he who seeks to save his life will lose it. But if you'll lose your life, if you'll lay it down, then you'll save it. But when you try to take control back of your life, you'll live out the carnal plan. There is a carnal plan for your life. Mm -hmm. So let's look at this real quickly. When I was a little kid, I was going to get, go back to this verse, but I just, I'm just i going to give you this story. When I was a little kid. My, my dad would take me to work with him. And uh, my dad, anybody, everybody, anybody ever met my dad? My dad is a working man. His, 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 his favorite thing to do is work. I'm telling you. Noah lived at his house, and he could tell you for certain. He, if you're not working, you're not living. My dad's ideal day is to get up in the morning and go hunting first thing in the morning and kill his food that he's going to eat for the next month. That's his ideal day. And he's, he's good. If you were to go to his house, you'd see the game all over the wall. He's got a whole barn that's full of nothing but trophies, and he didn't just kill them to put them up on the wall. He ate them, or he put them in the mission field and fed, fed people that were hungry. But... Anyhow, my, my dad's ideal day is to get up in the morning and go hunting. Then by the time everybody's on the job, he's already killed his deer, cleaned his deer. He's at the job, leading the job. And then after he gets through, he wants to get in the plane, fly to another city, yeah, and preach. And then he wants to restart the whole thing over the next day. And I've seen that. I'm, I'm telling you, I've seen those days. We, we built a house in Louisiana and preached every night and every day. My dad and I were building a house. We built it from the ground to the place that we put the decking and the tar paper on in three weeks. My dad and I and a couple men, and every night he preached like a wild man, and every day we worked from before the sun came up until we had to go home and we'd go to church. And that was back in the day when it wasn't cool to, to not dry your hair before you go to church. I was so frustrated. My dad didn't even give me time to even, I, I need, you know, you had to have them wings and fly back, you know, back in those days. I couldn't even dry my hair. 
Because my dad was, let's go. And my dad's middle name is Sco. He don't even say go. Sco. And say, let's go. He says, Sco. Everything is fast in a hurry. I ate so many meals when I was a kid that I burnt my tongue. Seriously, burnt my tongue because my dad says, Sco. We, can't, we don't have time for you to swallow that. Eat. So most of the time, in, any, in, any of you that go out to eat with me, you wonder. You look over at me and then my food's gone. And you're like, I still have trauma. I still have a... I, I still can't. All I know to do is when it's set in front of me, let's go, eat. I grew up on the road. Uh, most I was at home until I was 15. It was 21 nights in a year. Seriously, I'll say that slowly for some of you to pic- picture this. In my whole first 15 years of living, I was in church before I was a week old. And until I turned 15, tw- 21 nights was the most we was at home. We were in church every night of my life. Of the year, except for one year, we were out 21 nights. My dad felt like we were backslid. We were in church. We was in church every night. Not just in church. We were preaching. I was playing the drums. I was singing. Helping my dad lay hands in the altar. We had to have church. So I'm telling you, what I'm talking about is it's, it's in a hurry. You know, you've got to go, got to go. My, my, I can still see my mom behind my dad. He is dragging her like this through the airport parking lot. Me and the, my sister were behind. We're like this, trying to, trying to get into the plane because we had our own little plane, our private plane. And we would put all of our stuff up in that plane and we'd pack it and we'd go to the next city. We'd unload and sometimes it would go three to five days and sometimes it'd go five to six weeks. We'd keep preaching and preaching and preaching every night. Only night we had off was Saturday night. Thank God for Saturdays. Hallelujah. <laughs> Saturday night. But that night we was usually traveling. So that was the way I lived. Camp meeting. My mom playing the B3 organ. Doom, 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 That's why I grew up like that. Yeah, we had church. My dad playing the saxophone like boots riding off. Yaggity yak. It's going. Yeah. Yeah, you know that. Some of y'all don't know him, so I had to help you paint the picture and let you see. That's that's what I grew up in. I grew up in that every night of my life. And I grew up dad working. Well, my dad, sometimes we'd go to churches and churches would be They'd have a broken down whatever, and because my dad's a carpenter, uh, and my dad would say, well, I'll fix that for you. Sometimes we'd stay in little, uh, uh, they called them parsonages, um, and uh, I, I've, I've figured out what most parsonages are. They're everybody's people's, there's everybody's parts of leftover stuff they throw in a place and let the evangelist or the pastor stay in. It's terrible. Beds with springs that are going like this, and <laughs> toasters that one side don't, don't go up, and Everything that's broken, we're going to give it to God. We're going to give it to God. So we stayed in the broke down place of the give it to God file, yeah. Anyhow, but I, I literally got out of some places that I went to and slept on the floor because it felt better than the, than the bed they put me on. We stayed in some scary churches too when I was growing up. They put me in a Sunday school room on some cots when we go to church. And the bathrooms are over there. And I'd, my mom and dad would get up in the middle of the night and I'd say, I need to go to the bathroom. they said, well, just go in there. And I said, I don't, I'm scared. <laughs> a church in the church. I, I'm scared. You're going, going running to the bathroom. I'm talking like running, sliding on the floor, <laughs> trying to go to the bathroom quick. <laughs> but they put us on army cots. Churches, they were so poor they couldn't even spell poor. They didn't even have to afford the R at the end. <laughs> Anyhow, but we had a time. I grew up like that, but we, there'd be things broke down, and my dad would say, I'll fix it. Well, I'll fix it. So we're not only preaching, we're working. So when, if you can picture me when I was little, whether it was at my granddaddy's or whether I was with my dad uh, uh, on the road. My granddaddy was a master carpenter as well. My other grandfather is a, is a, was a contractor. So I was always around building, always around working and, and building. So my dad would put me over, and I was in the cleanup thing when I was little. You get the broom, you had to clean it up. Clean it up, son. So I, I got barely even hold this stupid thing. I'm trying to hold the broom. and You know, you ever watch a kid sweep? They get more mess everywhere else than they get in the pile. You know I'm telling the truth. Anyhow, you're trying to train him up, aren't you? <laughs> Anyhow, I'd sweep. I'd get my little pile, and then I'd find myself getting some boards out and 
I'd get the boards out and I'd start making me something out of it because I was wooking. I couldn't, I couldn't say work. I said wook, wooking. I'm a wooking. My dad would give me a little hammer or something and I'm a wooking. I'm wooking on whatever I'm building. And my granddaddy, I couldn't get it to nail together or whatever, to, whatever I needed to do. I was real little. And so they'd bring me uh, some, some nails and my granddad would nail it together and I'd have boards like this and I'd make me little airplanes or cars and I'd dr- all over the place. So whatever mess I cleaned up was messier when I was through, but I was wooking. There's a lot of people that don't know how to wook their faith because they don't have love. And so what they do is they spend their life striving in the flesh trying to make an impact and they're working hard working really hard because they don't have nothing but flesh striving in the flesh you know I could I could get enough oomph, enough muscle that I can do this after a while but it sure is hard to do this if all I'm doing it is in natural strength. It's hard. But when you get to move in the Spirit, and you allow the Holy Spirit to get you connected to the source, we have a men in the house that go, hoo, 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 ha, ha, ha. Yeah. Tool time, right? Ha, ha, ha. Can you do it? When you get a tools in the Spirit, You don't have to strive in the flesh and do it all with your might and power. How many know it's not by might nor by power? It's by what? By my spirit, says the Lord. When you get in the spirit, you can take and you can begin to make an impact without much effort. Faith works by love. You try to work your faith to heal the sick, to cast out devils, and you do it without love, you're doing it with your own might and power, your own strength. But you can literally, come up here, son, come help me. You can literally spend your time, hold that too, you're going to be very talented today. (laughs) You could spend your time trying to Make an impact, or you can take and make impact easy. Why are the sick not being healed? What is powering your faith? It, do you have compassion? Is it love? Because if it's love... If that's the motivation for bringing somebody out of a wheelchair, if it's love and it's not because you want people to have an article to write about you in charisma, if you don't want them to put you on TV because you healed the sick, but if you really want to do it because you just love the loss. Now that one's stripped out. That one got stripped out because somebody's working in the arm of the flesh. How many of you ever tried to make an impact and you couldn't make an impact because you wore it out? How many of you got relationships with people? You try to see one to the Lord, but you can't, you can't make that impact in their life because they've been beat up by the church. Talk to me. People don't want to even be in the church. They say, I don't want to be in the church because I don't feel love. What's up with that? This place is supposed to be the house of love. But we can't have, we can't walk in love if we spend our life in the flesh. Can't make an impact. But we can make an impact if we'll work by love. So when I prophesy, I wish somebody would get this in their spirit. When I prophesy, if it's originated out of love, then I'm not looking for the evil that's in them. I'm looking to bring them into the the greatness and the calling and the purpose, come on, and the destiny that God has for them. 
so you get around some people that flow in the gifts and, and, and they see devils under everything. They see, I see devils everywhere. And you know what? I'm, wonder, I'm worried about those people. I'm worried about people that always see devils. You got to see God sometime. <laughs> Come on. There has to be something good. I discern it. I discern it. I discern it. I discern it. I, there's a devil. There's a devil. Uh, you ma- he didn't say, oh, magnify the devil with me. He said, oh, magnify the Lord. Love is the oomph of life. Love is the oomph of life. When I was a kid, I played basketball, and I still love to play basketball today, but I can remember when I learned to play basketball, I was four years old when somebody put a basketball in my hand for the first time, and I fell in love. I love this game. I love basketball. I'm telling you, if I wasn't doing what I'm doing right now, one of the things I'd probably be doing is coaching. I love to coach basketball. I've coached high school boys teams, high school girls teams, junior high teams, little kids teams that you, they, they, the ball bounces over their head. I just love basketball. I love the game. I love the March Madness that's going on right now and all the teams playing. I just love I love the NBA. Even though the Magic's in a rebuilding phase, it seems like they're always in a rebuilding stage since I moved here. I still love me some basketball. Somebody said, do you love the Magic? Yes, there's my team. I live in Orlando. I know some of you have forsaken them and went somewhere else, but I still have faith that someday we won't trade away our best players and we will win. I just... Have faith. How many will have faith and touch and agree with me for that? It's like we're a farm team. We train everybody and f- send them to Miami or the Lakers or somewhere to win the championship. The Celtics. We give our coach to the Celtics and they win. Like, anyhow, forgive me for my moment of humanity. Pardon it, please. But anyhow, I love basketball. So when I was four, they put a basketball in my hand. And I saw that hoop up there 10 feet away, and it was before they had this thing that was smart that had a contraption to raise the goal and go up and down. I'm dating myself for real now. It was when you nailed it up there on a tree or on a pole, you know. So I had that, and I sit out there in Arkansas. I was in 56, Arkansas. Yes, there is a town called 56. 56. Why? Because there was only 56 people when they made it a town. (laughs) 56, Arkansas. I sure enough did. I, they gave me that basketball. I sat out there with George Cartwright, and he, there really was a George Cartwright. I'm not talking about Bonanza. There was my best friend. His name was George Cartwright, and we sit out there in 56, and he was a year or so older than me, and he could make it, and I couldn't, and it really frustrated me that I couldn't get it in that hoop, and I stayed out there, and it was dark, and my parents were like, come in. No, I got to get it in that hole. Got to get it in that hoop. Reminds me of this little boy right here, uh, Hunter. When He's not little anymore, but when he was little, he, I, we had his first room set up, and I got him this little Nerf goal and put the little goal up in the little side of the room and we were shooting everything was fine until daddy went back to show him that he could shoot it from the other side of the room I should have never did that because as soon as I did that he didn't want to make it anymore by the goal he wanted to make it outside the room like daddy from the door it was not good and dad and hunter has a hard head he is very persistent he is very, he's going to do it. And when he was little, it was like he was sitting over there in the door. I've got two stories going at once. Are you following me? He's sitting over there at the goal, and he's looking at the goal, and he's throwing it. And, and I'm like, son, come up closer. No. No. I'm going to make it. No. And he cried. And he stayed there until he made it, bless God. I think it bounced off the wall and made it in there, but he made it, man. He made it. But he, I'm telling you, it was like, I was like, come up here. No, I made it. And he made it. And I can remember me, four years old, 56 Arkansas. Same thing. I guess I got a hard head too. Same thing. I know I do. It came from my, anyhow. I sit there, they're like, you think? Yeah. (laughs) 
It's a good thing God uses this hard hit or I'd already be gone. Amen. <laughs> Sometimes it's good, right? And the girl said, yeah, amen. All right. Every once in a while, Dad. Anyhow, so I take that ball and I'm throwing it up there, everything I could. And I can remember the sound that it, when it went in, shoo, I was hooked. I love string music. Oh. Yes, I made it. I can remember getting in, making the team, playing on the team. I was the smallest dude on the team. All of them were older than me. And they put me in my first game. And in my first game, I made a shot. And that made me really feel good. I was wearing them Converse, them blue canvas Converse. I'm really dating myself now. I guess they could throw them back now. Anyhow, and they had the little white little star. I made, and then they, they fouled me, and I went to the free throw line, and I made both of my free throws. So I had four points in my first game. And I thought I was big stuff. But I was hooked. But I remember moving to Florida and playing on a team, and the coach told me I was shooting wrong because I, I was so little when I first started and so skinny that I just, you know, I know you all are thinking, are you skinny? Yeah, I was skinny. Don't... <laughs> Don't, don't you think like that at me, all right? Yeah, I used to be like the karate kid skinny, you know, like, yeah, I can do it somehow. Now. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I was like this skinny. <laughs> I, was, I was skinny. They put me on weight gain. They put me, y'all like, what is spiritual about this? You're going to get the point. <laughs> they put me on weight gain. I ate four meals a day, Bill. Four meals. My co- I would eat peanut butter and marshmallow sandwiches at night. Yes, two of them, and drink milk and weight gain, and I couldn't gain weight. I played football. They put me in the pads. They put me down, Brad, as 175 pounds. I wasn't 175 pounds with the helmet, with the pads, <laughs> sopping wet. I mean, I was skinny. You know, I, saw, I was little, and I was playing basketball, and I developed this habit from when I was four from playing, of shooting from down here, pushing it, trying to get it to the goal. So what that does with your shot, for anybody that doesn't know, and some of you say, I really don't want to know, but you'll make it. It's all right. <laughs> what that does with your shot is anybody that defends you, they can pack you. You, don't even have, you can be Spud Webb. You can be a little guy, and they'll pack you all the time because you shoot from too low. This is the way a lot of people are with their faith. They've developed this habit of trying to work things up in the flesh, get things to where they need to go. Or they're like Hunter over in the south room. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. And every time they pray for somebody or minister, so, God, you're going to do it. Please do it, God. Or they're like me until dark at night going, I'm not going inside. I'm going to make it. This is what they do. And they live their life this way. And so I was getting packed. And my coach, he said, you're shooting wrong. But see, my shot was going in. But I was getting packed. And I developed the wrong habit. I didn't have the oomph that I needed. I was bringing it up from everything I had and lunging it. It wasn't as accurate as it should be. So what happened? My coach said, will not you bring your arm up? Felt very awkward. He put this little contraption around me, made my arms up, come up like this, and I had to shoot like this. And then this hand was too involved in the shot, so he taped my fingers together. He taped my hand, and I walked around with the taped hand. I was like, what am I going to do with this? He said, stop Messing with your shot with the other hand. He was a mean coach. He was a good coach, so. Good coaches are hard on you. Good apostles and pastors and teachers and evangelists and prophets are hard on you sometimes. Don't shout me down when the preaching is good. But he started helping me work on this hand. And, get, and after a while, I didn't need this harness around me I didn't, to keep my elbow in so that my shot would go right. Is anybody here a basketball player know what I'm talking about? You're, you're with me. After a while, it was, 
it was uh, muscle memory. That arm just went up straight. So I'm, when I'm shooting, I could be in triple threat position. I could be ready, and I could shoot right in your eye before you even knew it was coming. I wasn't coming down and coming up, and that's why I set the record in the state with three-pointers, held it for several years, seven in a row in a game. Why? Because my coach worked on it and got me to a place of umph. So there was umph. There was, there was muscle. I wasn't having to work. See, when you play the drums even, when you play the drums, I'll just, just come with me over here, Mr. Cameraman. When you play the drums, here, hold this. When you play the drums, you have to use your wrist. There's people that play like this. They play stiff. They play like that, and they're war they're, they wear themselves out, but if you let the stick do the work, you can, your, your sticks and your wrists will do the work. When you hammer something, anybody with me? When you're hammering, if you hammer, some of you, some of you are like, what is he talking about today? I'm talking about what love will do for you. Some people... <laughs> you guys are something. I wish I had a hammer in my hand. But if, you had, if, if I had a hammer here today, if you use a hammer like this, and some of you do this, ladies, men, you don't m nail like this. You don't keep your, You let the hammer, the weight of the hammer, my granddaddy taught me that, do the work. If you let the head of the hammer come down, you can put a nail in fast. Isn't that right, Ted? But if you do it like this, you're going to be wore out and you have a lot of nails that are bent. This is the way it is with a lot of people. They don't have any oomph. But when I got that coach taught me to get the right form and I started shooting with the right form, then the next thing he said to me, he said, you need more oomph. He said, I want you to bring, I want you to bend your knees and when you shoot, I want it to come motion through your body shoot it so all the force and all the oomph come up out of me came through that ball that ball spin <laughs> then I got to hear that sound I really like string music <laughs> <laughs> that's what you hear in the spirit come on I'm not saying you got to hear a net but you hear in the spirit you're making it every time when you have Love, or can I say, when you have oomph. Without love, you don't have the oomph to make the basket, to make the scores, to do what God's called you to do. There's a lot of people saying, it no worker. It no, it no worker. We have a guy that comes here and ministers, Dr. Uh, Michael Scannelberry, and he says, she broke when he's praying in tongues. He'll be praying in tongues, she broke and we all the time tease him, he fix her. <laughs> she broke her. <laughs> oh, bah, 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 bah. She broke her, he'll say. And then we'll go, he fix her. <laughs> but there's a lot of people that their faith no worker. Because they have no love. You got to have love. Faith works by love. Faith works by what? So you can spend your life striving, barely seeing anything happen, or you can move to a place that you get connected to God. Because, see, even this, you can have the right tool, but if you're not connected to the power source, it's not going to work. God is what? So when I get connected to God, the power source... Then I can demonstrate the love of God in the earth. So when I cast out devils, I am demonstrating the kingdom. I demonstrate the kingdom. Why? Because I love the person that's possessed. I'm trying to help you. I, my love for the possessed person doesn't want to leave them in that state. So I'm, I'm full of love, and I want to eradicate the devil and get them full of love too. Hallelujah. So faith works by love. Faith 
works by love. Stand to your feet with me. You get anything out of this today? So, said, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by what? By the Holy Spirit who has who was given to us. So the Holy Spirit was given to me so that I could make an impact. So that what is in me could invade darkness and touch people's lives. If I stay in the flesh, if I stay trying to do this kingdom stuff in my might and power, I might make a little bit of an impact. But I'm going to wear me out and I'm going to wear the end of things out. But If I move into love and I live in love, I'll start making the impact that God wants me to make. God wants you to make an impact. He wants you to make a mark that can't be erased. Amen? Amen. He wants you to touch the world. And you do it through love. This house has been called by the Lord to awaken this city. How can we awaken this city? Is it just because we're going to be full of this fire and we're going to prophesy? No. It's because we're so full of love that when we love this city, this city will be awakened to Him. Oh, come on now. Help me out. Snow White was asleep. Remember? going Disney on you. She was asleep. She had dealt with the seven dwarfs. That's exactly what the spirits do to the church. They try to dwarf the church. Dwarfs. We go in and talk about those seven spirits if we wanted or seven dwarfs. But what awakened Snow White? True love. Come on, work with me. She had to be awakened by the kiss of God, by the love of God. Some of you said, you're going to go Disney on us and preach to us? Yeah. When this city is embraced and kissed with the love of God, breathe again. City beautiful will live again. Why? Because the love of God will touch them. So when you prophesy, if you prophesy and they feel the kiss of love, when you cast out devils, when you heal the sick, when you minister to people on the job, when you do an act of kindness, whatever it is, whatever you do, if it originates in love, and it's not just because you're wanting them to turn or burn, their homosexual lifestyle or whatever it is they're in sin but you really love them you're going to have a lot of snow whites come on somebody a lot of people come out from under those powers of darkness and breathe and awaken again why? because of his love I want them to sing this song again and as they do if you want to be baptized in his love today want to be baptized in 1 Corinthians 13 love. You say, Apostle, I, I, want, to, I want to walk in his love. Joshua, I, I want to live this lifestyle of love. I want to move beyond where I've been into a greater love. This is the work of Holy Spirit. Listen, this is the work of Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit comes so that hope is not disappointed. Holy Spirit comes to give us this life of love. He didn't come just so you could shakaka, na na na. He didn't come just so you could ride a Mahonda and see my Suzuki. He didn't come so you could untie my tie, untie my bow tie see my time he didn't come so you could just fall over 
and shake. All those things are irrelevant. And we fall under his power. We pray in the spirit. But he came to put love in you so that you could love the unlovable. So you could look at somebody just like he looked at you when you didn't love yourself. And you would be able to love them. You'd be able to prophesy when there was no music. Come on. You'd be able to heal the sick when there's no, no feeling of anointing in the room. Just love motivated you to go get that person out of the wheelchair. Love motivated you to go heal the sick and cleanse the leper and raise the dead. Freely you have received. Freely you go and get. That's love. So if you want to be baptized in this love today, lift your hand up. Say, I want, I want to be baptized. I want to be immersed. I want to be submersed. I want to be plunged deep. I want to go deep in love. I want to be rooted and grounded in love. I want to live this lifestyle of love. If that's you, lift that hand up. Say, that's me. That's me. If you raise your hand, this altar's open for you to come up as they sing and just receive. Just let the Holy Spirit do this work in you. Baptize them in your love, Lord. Go ahead, come on, sing out for us. Jesus. Baptize us in 1 Corinthians 13, love, Jesus. Oh, I'm 
through me. Touch through me. Healing through me. Healing through me. Living through me. Living through me. It's your love, your love, your love, your love, your love, your love, your love. Flowing through me. Flowing through me. It's your love, your love, your love, your love, your love, your love, your love. Touching through me. Making them see. Oh, it's your love, 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 reaching through me, reaching through me, it's reaching through me, Father, it's your love, it's your love, your love, your love, your love, your love. Living through me, flowing in me, setting me free, touching through me, singing through me, Lord, reaching. What you see, oh, it's your love, 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 setting them free, setting them free. Oh, God, it's your love, your love. Washing over me, washing over me, baptizing me, baptizing me. Oh, it's your love, your love, your love, your love, your love, touching through. Reaching through me, setting the free Lord. Oh, we were created to love, created to love. Oh, we were
of his love in this place. Hallelujah. Immersed, submersed in his love, totally intoxicated with his love. Mm. Thank you for your love, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Love is. Love is. Come on, sing it. Love and make this declaration with me. Say, we declare and we decree that what love is that we've read about in 1 Corinthians 13 in John 3, 16 that we will live in that kind of love. That that love is shed abroad in our hearts. And out of that love, we will live life. We will love you, and we will love one another. And we'll love this city back to life again. We'll love this nation and the nations and future generations for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, put your hands together and lift up a shout of praise. Hallelujah.